This is Casey James. I don't know where exactly I am. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot I don't know. But I'm going to figure it out. It's Deacon, lying on the altar in the middle of the room, in the centre of a circle of hooded figures chanting in some strange, hissing language that I don't recognise, never mind understand. And also Deacon, standing next to me, holding a switched-off flashlight. I swallow and look sideways at him. So... Anything you want to tell me? Game's up, I guess, he says. This bait-and-switch thing is getting really old, I say. Next time I'll just let Pan and his groupies have you then, shall I? He asks. I just watch him. He smiles with Deacon's face. Then he says... You should come down. Get him out of here. That altar's had its fill of blood already. Before I can think of how to respond to that, there's a sort of groaning rumble, and the ground and the walls shake. Then they shake again, harder, and I realise belatedly that there's an earthquake happening around me as pieces of masonry start to fall to the ground. You'll want to move quickly if you're going says Knock Deacon. Then he strides out through the doorway and into the chamber, and somehow I lose sight of him in the shadows and the falling rock. He still has the only flashlight, and it's still turned off, so I think I can be forgiven for not being able to see very well. The other Deacon makes a muffled noise like a mm, shout which... Mm. I mean, the whole room is still shaking and rumbling, and it looks like most of the ceiling is in the process of collapsing, so that's fair. He's tied to the altar, although he's making a good effort at wriggling his way off it, and it looks like the robed figures who were chanting and circling him have fled. I don't blame them. Being buried alive in a caved-in underground crypt was not on my bucket list either. I make my way across the cavern to the altar, and I almost flinch at the naked gratitude and relief I see on Deacon's face when he sees me. I cut the ropes off him, the entire twisted tangle of them, with my pocket knife. I may not have a flashlight, but I do not go anywhere without my pocket knife. Except to clubs and on aeroplanes, trains, because, you know, I prefer not being arrested or thrown out of a venue. My point is, I have my pocket knife, and I manage to saw through the ropes that someone, presumably the robed figures, have tied in complex twisting patterns around Deacon's arms and legs and torso. I actually feel a grim sort of satisfaction at ruining the carefully laid out glyphs made of knotted rope. I'm so glad to see you is the first thing Deacon says when I manage to cut the knot holding the gag in place and get the thing off him. Yeah, I mutter. Can you stand? He can. He does. He hobbles along with me as I pick my way across the room, both of us flinching in sync every time there's a creak or rumble from the ceiling or a crash from somewhere. We can barely see since half the phosphorus and fungi or whatever were on the walls that have fallen down or have rock piled over them. But we stumble our way along anyway. There's no way we can continue onward or downward, not with the place falling apart around us. So we head back up the way I came in. It doesn't lead back the same way. The stairs are the same, that narrow tunnel with its uneven steps and faint, phosphorescent light, but at the top it comes out into a big square room rather than the tunnel I expected. Better lit than I expected, too, 
The space has the same sort of skylight vents that the main crypt had, and there's moonlight filtering in through them. The room we're in is full of limestone and granite blocks, chiseling tools and clay models like a sculptor's studio. It has a dusty sort of smell to it, like old books and beach sand, and there are half-finished carvings around the edges of the room as well. One big block of limestone has a mermaid half emerged from it, so lifelike that I expect to see her blink, although she doesn't. In the corner, a sphinx crouches, his face peering out from one side of a piece of some stone I can't identify, his leonine hindquarters emerging from the other side, while his shoulders do not yet exist. There is a table, too, in the middle of the room. Papers are scattered across it, held down by pieces of stone and dried chunks of clay. I walk over to take a look, my eyes flicking across pen and ink sketches and diagrams and catching on a thin, leather-bound notebook that's lying open on the table. The light isn't great, and it's handwritten so it isn't really the words that catch my attention. I can read them, but only if I squint. It's the handwriting itself. That is Kezia Gilman's handwriting, the same that I'd seen on the scattered papers in the front room of the bridge house, that I still have a sample of in the few pages I'd picked up there and kept. I look up to ask Deacon if he actually has a flashlight, which I really should have checked before now, but I haven't. And I can't immediately see him. That gives me a start, a little flash of adrenaline, but then I hear him on the other side of the room. Casey, he says, you'll want to see this. I'm pretty sure I don't actually. I walk over towards his voice anyway. I find Deacon behind the Sphinx, in front of an open doorway. He does have a flashlight, which he has switched on and is shining through into the next room. An artist's storeroom of some sort, maybe. It's empty, except for two more statues. They're human, a woman kneeling and looking up in a posture of adoration or worship, and a man standing beside her, one hand resting on her shoulder. Both are looking out at the doorway and, therefore, at us. I can feel horror twisting my guts like nausea, because the two people standing there, made of stone, are David and Leanne. Perfectly rendered, down to the last eyelash, the curl of hair that had escaped Leanne's ponytail, David's ripped jeans. On Leanne's head is a bronze headdress, almost a crown, made of intertwined serpents, their heads and tails draping down over her hair and rising up into the air above her head. Bright chips of some precious or semi-precious stone wink and glitter in their eye sockets, contrasting horribly with the dead stone eyes and face beneath them. On the floor between us and the statues, sitting right in the threshold, is a clay jar about the size of a teapot, sealed with dark red wax. I did not want to see that. Really? Because I thought creepy weird stuff was your thing, and this is both creepy and weird. I shake my head. Nope. I could have gone forever without having seen that. Now I'm going to wonder what turned them to stone. My mind lurches back to the bridge house. To the statue of Perseus, holding the severed head of Medusa while it slowly turned towards me, 
to walking along the mirrored hallway, eyes shut in case some monster out of Greek mythology turned me to stone. I think I might actually have PTSD after all this. I am definitely going to need therapy. Turned them to stone? Says Deacon. But seriously, turned to stone? Weird and creepy, I say. He shudders. I just thought it was weird, finding statues of them here. And the snake crown. Thought you might want to keep it. I really don't, I say. That's not entirely true, though. There's part of me that does want to keep it. Wants to go in there and pick the awful thing up and wear it, feel the weight of it on my skull. It's heavy. I can tell just by looking at it. But not unpleasantly heavy, just heavy enough to feel it, to remind you that it's there. It might be useful, says Deacon. It's here for a reason. He sounds like he's trying to convince himself of that as much as he's trying to convince me. I am not convinced. Look, I say, we can take the clay jar instead. That's more likely to be useful. What use is a snake headdress going to be? He shrugs. But he picks the thing up anyway, so I shrug back. Against my better judgment, I pick up the clay jar. It's lighter than it looks. I head back towards the table where I left Kezia's journal, and put the jar down next to it. When I glance up, Deacon is still over next to the Sphinx, messing around with the snake headdress which he's put on now. Hey, can you come over here with the light? He turns, and a split second before he faces me, I have this skin-crawling sense of dread, of what if. What if the headdress really does do something? What if this is linked to Kezia's Medusa with the snake hair thing? What if it's not really Deacon again? Not that I know him that well, but... We're in this together now. Just... what if? And he finishes turning around and faces me, and the worst thing that happens is he shines the flashlight in my face by accident. I squint and frown at him, and hold a hand up between my eyes and the light. Sorry, he says. <sighs> I sigh. But he's pointed the flashlight at the ground, so it's not blinding me anymore. And that's good enough. With the light on it, I can read the journal more easily. It looks like a set of dated entries, like a diary. The entry the journal is open to is about an old temple in Honduras, hidden deep in the rainforest, and a rite that might have once been practiced there, called the Feast of Foxes. Kezia had found some local to show her the ruins, the only one who'd go near them. The locals called him Mad Dan, and so does she. Crazy, says Deacon, who obviously reads faster than I do. Listen, it was no ordinary mummy. Its skin seemed hardened like stone, and its eyes had been removed and replaced with carved turquoise eyeballs. Its teeth, too, had been replaced with carved turquoise, and around its neck was a gold chain holding the key. Mad Dan assured me that this stone figure was the high priest himself, beloved of the god, but I would have known anyway from that pendant. I scan further down the page to see where he's reading this from. But the letters blur in front of me, and I can't quite grasp them. What does she say about the key? I ask. Deacon obligingly reads another passage further down the page. The treasure of the temple was supposed to be hidden in the subterranean crypt, but there is no evidence of one. I will have to ask Lord Dark if... He breaks off reading as another rumble shakes the walls. 
Uh, maybe we should get out of here and read it later. One of the statues, a delicate monkey-like thing, falls over and shatters. There's another door out of this room, and we take it. It leads into a sort of workroom, half sunk into the ground, with windows looking out across the graveyard from before. I'm not sure how we're at ground level, because I must have gone down at least two flights of stairs all up, and I'm pretty sure I only went up one. But there we are. There are windows, halfway up the walls on the inside, and ground level on the outside. There's a table in the middle of the room, and a wooden bench against one wall, both empty, and rows of what look like stone pews, shoved untidily against the opposite side of the room. And there is something in here with us. I don't know what it is. I don't even know how I know it's here. I can't see anything. And the voices I feel like I can hear are... There's no actual sound. No whispering. No chanting. No soft sea sound like waves lapping at some alien shore. But I can feel it all the same. Like I can feel eyes watching us from the darkness. I can hear the echoes of those sounds coming from the stone, where there are no disturbing murals painted or carved, and nothing beyond the pews. Well, they could just be stone benches, I guess, to suggest that this was a chapel once. It was, though. The faint light glitters on the snake headdress making the snakes seem alive as they shift and swing with Deacon's movements, their gemstone eyes gleaming in the dark. I can see moonlight glint off of Deacon's eyes as he turns, and I'm uncertain again for that moment, if this is the real Deacon or the other one. If there even is a real one. Turns out... Paranoia is a natural consequence of confusion and this sort of non-linear narrative. I shiver and tuck my doubts deep inside the back of my brain where I don't need to look at them, and hopefully no one else can tell that they're there. I feel Walker's presence for a moment. A warmth and a sort of shifting at the back of my mind like he's moving to make room for those doubts and paranoid thoughts to tuck away in the same space that he's hiding. It's really odd, but it's sort of comforting as well. Come on, let's get out of here, says Deacon. I nod silently and grab the journal and the clay jar, and we clamber up onto the bench and out of one of the windows. It lets out at ground level, at the edge of the graveyard, into a drift of night-blooming flowers that shine white in the moonlight and fill the air with their intoxicating scent. I glance back as we climb out into the moonlit night and pause. There, on the previously empty table, there is a golden goblet, a chalice, really, full of dark liquid. My first impression is that it's wine, although the paranoia kicks in almost immediately, and I wonder if it's blood, or ink, or something even less wholesome than that. I must make some sort of noise, because Deacon looks in through the window from where he's just climbed out ahead of me. He grimaces, his mouth twisting up a bit, but he doesn't say anything. I'm not going back for it, I say. I can hear those whispers louder now, that not exactly sound of chanting, half familiar words, and there's a fog starting to rise amongst the graves and the flowers. No, I don't think that would be a good idea, says Deacon. There's a light up there, maybe it's a house? I look, and he's right. There's a light out in the woods, 
away from the cliffs and the direction we'd come from. A warm, golden spark of light, like a distant window. I start walking without answering, without acknowledging the fog, without looking back at the golden chalice in the dark, sunken chapel, which is probably there for a reason, and would probably be useful. Deacon follows me.